Cervical cancer is one of those diseases that often develop silently, but the good news is, it's also one of the most preventable cancers. In this video, we'll break it down step by step. You'll learn what cervical cancer actually is, the main risk factors, the early signs and symptoms to never ignore, how doctors diagnose it, the treatment options available, and what outcomes look like today. Whether you're a medical student or just want to understand it better, by the end of this lesson, you'll have a clear picture of this disease and why early detection matters so much. So let's start with the basics. The cervix is the lower, narrow part of the uterus, the womb, that connects to the vagina. Think of it like a gateway. It helps allow passage of menstrual blood. It's involved in fertility. And during pregnancy, it helps keep the baby in place until it's time for delivery. Cervical cancer happens when cells in this gateway area start growing uncontrollably. Now, the number one cause of cervical cancer is infection with human papillomavirus, or HPV. HPV is extremely common. So common that most people who have ever been sexually active will be exposed at some point in their lives. The good news is that most of the time, the immune system clears HPV without any issues. But in some cases, especially with what we call high-risk strains, the virus doesn't go away. Instead, it lingers and slowly causes damage to the DNA inside cervical cells. Over years, sometimes decades, these changes can accumulate until the cells become precancerous and eventually cancerous. That's why cervical cancer usually develops gradually. It's not something that appears overnight. There are two main types of cervical cancer. The first is squamous cell carcinoma, which makes up about 70 to 80% of cases. This type starts in the thin, flat cells that line the outside of the cervix. The second is adenocarcinoma, which starts in the glandular cells that line the cervical canal, the part of the cervix inside the uterus. Adenocarcinomas are less common, but have been increasing over the last few decades. There are also rare types like adenosquamous carcinoma and small cell carcinoma, but those are much less common. Let's go deeper into risk factors. We already said HPV infection is the biggest one, but there are others that make it more likely that HPV will lead to cancer. Smoking is a big one. It doubles the risk. Chemicals in tobacco smoke can be found in cervical mucus, and they actually damage the DNA in cervical cells, making it harder for the body to repair HPV-related damage. Having multiple sexual partners or becoming sexually active at a young age increases exposure to HPV. Long-term use of birth control pills, especially more than five years, has been linked to a slightly higher risk, though the benefits of contraception for many women are still very important. A weakened immune system is another major factor. Women living with HIV or those on long-term immunosuppressive drugs, for example, after an organ transplant, are at higher risk because their immune system can't fight off HPV as effectively. Poor nutrition, especially diets lacking in fruits and vegetables, may also increase risk. And not getting regular screening tests like pap smears or HPV testing is a huge risk because those tests can detect precancerous changes long before they become cancer. All right, now signs and symptoms. In early stages, cervical cancer usually causes no symptoms at all. That's why it can quietly develop for years if there's no screening. When symptoms do appear, the most common one is abnormal vaginal bleeding. That can mean bleeding between periods, bleeding after sex, bleeding after menopause, or periods that are heavier or last longer than usual. Another symptom is unusual vaginal discharge. Sometimes watery, sometimes mixed with blood, sometimes foul smelling. Pain during sex, called dyspareunia, is another warning sign. As the cancer grows, women may notice pelvic pain, lower back pain, or even leg pain. In advanced disease, if the tumor presses on the bladder or bowel, it can cause problems with urination or constipation. If it blocks lymphatic drainage, swelling in one or both legs may occur. And in later stages, fatigue, weight loss, and loss of appetite can happen as well. Why do these symptoms happen? The abnormal bleeding occurs because the tumor has fragile blood vessels that break easily. Discharge comes from the breakdown of tumor tissue and sometimes from infection in the cervix. Pain during sex happens because the tumor involves deeper tissues or nerves. Pelvic or back pain often means the cancer has extended into nearby structures. Leg swelling is caused when lymph nodes are blocked and fluid can't drain properly. Now let's move on to diagnosis. This usually starts with screening. The pap smear or pap test has been around since the 1940s and has saved millions of lives. It involves gently scraping cells from the cervix and looking at them under a microscope to check for abnormal changes. Today, many countries also use HPV testing, which can detect high-risk strains of the virus before changes even appear. If either test is abnormal, the next step is a colposcopy. This is where a doctor uses a special magnifying instrument to closely examine the cervix. 
During colposcopy, the doctor may apply a mild solution that highlights abnormal areas and take small tissue samples, biopsies, for further study. If cancer is confirmed, staging tests are done to figure out how far it has spread. MRI is very useful for seeing how deeply the tumor has invaded the cervix. CT scans or PIT scans can check for spread to lymph nodes or distant organs. Staging goes from stage 1, where the cancer is only in the cervix, all the way to stage 4, where it has spread to distant parts of the body like the lungs or liver. Correct staging is critical because it guides treatment. Now, treatment and management. For very early changes that haven't yet become cancer, procedures like LEAP, loop electrosurgical excision, or cone biopsy, can remove the abnormal cells completely. For early-stage cervical cancer confined to the cervix, surgery is often the main treatment. This might mean a hysterectomy where the uterus and cervix are removed, sometimes along with nearby lymph nodes. For women who want to preserve fertility, there are procedures like radical trachelectomy, where the cervix is removed but the uterus is left intact. For larger tumors or when surgery isn't an option, radiation therapy is often used, sometimes combined with chemotherapy. This combination is called chemoradiation, and it's the standard for many locally advanced cases. The chemotherapy drug most commonly used is cisplatin. It makes the radiation more effective. For advanced disease, treatment may include systemic chemotherapy, drugs that travel throughout the body to kill cancer cells. Drugs like paclitaxel and carboplatin are common. Targeted therapy such as bevacizumab works by blocking blood vessel growth in tumors and can be added to chemotherapy. In recent years, immunotherapy has become an important option. Drugs like pembrolizumab, which boosts the immune system to recognize and attack cancer cells, have shown real benefits in advanced or recurrent cervical cancer. Clinical trials are ongoing and treatment options are expanding. Of course, treatments come with side effects. Surgery may cause infertility and if ovaries are removed, early menopause. Radiation can lead to fatigue, bowel or bladder irritation, and narrowing or dryness of vaginal tissues. Chemotherapy can cause nausea, vomiting, hair loss, and low blood counts. Immunotherapy can cause inflammation in different organs like the lungs or thyroid, though this is less common. That's why supportive care is a huge part of treatment. Counseling, nutrition support, physical therapy, and sexual health support all play key roles in helping patients maintain quality of life. If you're finding this breakdown helpful so far, do me a favor. Hit that like button and subscribe. It helps us a lot and keeps us going. Now let's talk prevention because cervical cancer is one of the most preventable cancers. The HPV vaccine is the biggest breakthrough. When given before exposure to the virus, usually in adolescence, it's extremely effective in preventing infection with the high-risk strains that cause most cervical cancers. Many countries now vaccinate both girls and boys because HPV affects everyone. Screening is the other pillar of prevention. Regular pap smears and HPV testing catch precancerous changes years before they turn into cancer. Treating those changes early is what prevents cancer from developing in the first place. Public health efforts to expand vaccination and screening, especially in lower-income countries, are crucial to reducing cervical cancer worldwide. What about prognosis? The outcome depends heavily on the stage at diagnosis. In stage 1, when the cancer is confined to the cervix, survival rates are very high, often above 90%. In stage 2 or 3, when the cancer spreads to nearby tissues or lymph nodes, survival drops but can still be good with effective treatment. Stage 4 disease, when the cancer has spread to distant organs, is much harder to treat. Newer therapies are improving outcomes. Globally, cervical cancer remains one of the leading causes of cancer death in women, especially in areas without widespread screening or vaccination. That's why prevention and early detection are so important. So, final thoughts. Cervical cancer is caused mainly by persistent HPV infection, but it's also one of the most preventable cancers we know. Vaccination, screening, and early treatment of precancerous changes can essentially eliminate it. Symptoms like abnormal bleeding, unusual discharge, or pain during sex should never be ignored. Treatments today are highly effective, especially when the cancer is caught early, and new therapies are making a difference even in advanced stages. And that wraps up our lesson on cervical cancer. If you find this video helpful, please make sure to hit that like button, and I'll see you in the next one.